fast here uh, because this is pretty much just the judgment that comes upon those that eat and drink of the Lord's Supper unworthily. Those that partake of the Lord's Supper unworthily and the judgment that comes. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat of this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the blood the body, of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. Did you see that? He said that we should not be condemned with the world. So there's a judgment that must come from, be, from within. So we are not judged like the world. Has to be. Has to take place. Our judgment is a chastening of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. Wherefore, my brethren, when ye come together to eat, tarry one for another. If any man hunger, let him eat at home, that ye come not together into condemnation. And the rest will I set in order when I come. Paul said that many were, seek, were sick, sickly, and many were weak and sickly, and many slept. They were, they were weak, they were sickly, and they slept. That some died among them. Why? Because they did not observe the Lord's Supper after the biblical fashion. But you have to read the whole book in context to understand what he's saying. You've got to understand what he's doing in Corinthians. What he's doing is correction all the way through. If you don't understand that, and he's fixing the order that is messed up, if you don't follow along with that, then you just take a few verses out of context and say, well, the Lord's Supper says every man examines himself, period. No, it doesn't say that, period. What you're doing is ignoring the rest of the book of Corinthians where he's teaching this church all the way through what the proper order is because they're all in disorder. If you don't understand that, and that's why Brother Ickes says you've got to read whole, whole books of the Bible at a time. You just can't take a few verses here and pull them out of context or one chapter and say, well, none of, you can divorce it from the rest of the Scriptures. You can't. You can't do that. You can't divorce church discipline from, from baptism and the Lord's Supper. You cannot do that. You have no biblical authority to say, well, discipline has nothing to do with the table. Yes, it does. It has everything to do with it. Because those that are walking disorderly should not even be near that table. They shouldn't even be among you. That's what the Bible says. We're going to show that in a minute here. If you follow Paul's instructions, and I want you to turn there in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Turn there, please. I'm going to read through this. You've heard this before. It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. And ye are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I verily as absent in body, but present in spirit, have judged already as though I were present concerning him that hath so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together, and my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. In the Lord Jesus, excuse me. Your glory is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened, for even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Unleavened bread. Sincerity and truth. Is he giving us a picture here? Is he getting at something here? He is. I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators. You're not to, our church is not to company with fornicators. And he goes on, he clarifies, yet not all together with the fornicators of this world, or with covetous, or extortioners, or with idolaters, for then you must needs go out of the world. Hmm. But now I've written unto you not to keep company. If any man that is called a brother, would he stop at just fornication? No. 
Now, churches don't even do that now. They, they don't stop at fornication. They don't even care about fornication anymore. They just let it go on. People can live together, do whatever. They can be members of the church. They'll yoke the bodies up together. Their body up together with a harlot. They don't care. They'll be unequally yoked with, with non-believers and with lost, with lost people and those that walk disorderly. But what did Paul say? But now I've written unto you not to keep company. If any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner, with such a one know not to eat. Folks, they're not even supposed to be at the table. They're not supposed to be in the church. Do you understand that? If they're walking disorderly, if they're walking in sin and wickedness, they're not even supposed to be there. So then you have, I've been said people say, well, it says little man, so examine himself. I agree. That's a man examining inwardly, according to the scriptures, his heart, after the body has judged outwardly that he's worthy to be a part of that assembly. That he has obeyed the scriptures and he's followed them. He has repentance unto life. It's not just anybody that comes along that wants to be there. No, it's an examination that is done. That's why we don't just enter everybody into the body. That's why we don't do that here. That's why we're very careful in the past when we haven't been. It comes back to bite us. No. Exactly. And that's what he's getting at, that the, that the heart, you got to examine your heart according to the scriptures, make sure you're walking right with God. But, does that, so does that mean that I'm not supposed to, that the church isn't supposed to judge somebody uh, when they come to him and say, well, I'm saved, well then, okay, they just said they're saved, so we'll just baptize them. No. Just because they say it doesn't mean they are. Paul says, but now I've written unto you not to keep company if any man that is called a brother be a fornicate, is called a brother, be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner which such a one know not to eat. For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within? But them that are without God judges. Therefore, put away from among yourselves that wicked person. Okay, well, well, they're 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 wicked and they've done some things wrong. But you know, who am I to judge? You're commanded to judge. Our church is commanded that we we are accountable one another and we do judge one another. Now that don't mean we we judge each other's motives because we can't do that, right? What we can do is, uh, is judge the actions. And if there's sin, if there's sin, then yeah, you don't let them come to the table. Amen. You don't let somebody in sin. You put them out from among you so they're not at the table. So they're not in the assembly until they repent and get things right. And then you restore them. But you can't just let anybody come in and do that. It's wrong. It's not biblical. But them that are without God judges, therefore put away from among yourselves that wicked person. Is he talking about just fornication? No. What is he talking about? Open, any open sin? He's talking about sin that people live in that are, that's open and wicked. He listed them. Think about it. If any man called a brother, be a fornicator, or covetous, or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner. You know, it sounds like Paul don't Paul doesn't believe in Christian drunks or Christian fornicators or Christian idolaters. That doesn't mean that somebody couldn't commit any of those sins. It means they must repent of those and get it right with God. Amen. And get it right so they can be brought back into the assembly. 
If it goes that far, if they repent before that, then they don't have to leave. If they get it right before that, and I've taught on that before, I don't have time to go into that. Now, let me ask you a question. Do you think it'd be, it would be easier to follow the instructions of the Word of God at 1 Corinthians chapter 5 that deals with discipline of unruliness and people in sin than to come to 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and then just say, well, a man has to examine himself, so you can't forbid anybody from coming to the table. Oh, yes, you can. If you follow the Bible, you'll do it. You'll discipline them out and write whoever is a member. Whoever's a member has access to that table. But if they're on discipline, then they're out. Does it make sense that you will not discipline somebody else that's not part of your body? So you have somebody that comes into the assembly as a visitor when we have the Lord's Supper next week, and they say, well, we want to partake of the Lord's Supper. No. Why? We don't know you. But what if they're a family friend? That's fine. They can be a family friend, but that doesn't make any difference. We're still, we're still not coming to the table. Now, the best way around that is don't invite your family and friends to that service. Amen. Why? Because it's a local church ordinance. That's why. See, you have all covenanted together to follow God. You're going one direction. Who knows what direction they're at? How do you know that, that, some, that some Pentecostal speaking in tongues uh, person didn't baptize that person and said, well, I've been saved and baptized? Really? How do you know? Have you looked at it? Have you even asked them? Have you... So pastors today let everybody come in and, well, you examine yourself. You just got to be saved and baptized, but I don't have to verify anything. Really, so you do for your own members, but you're saying people that come outside, you don't? Does that make any sense to you at all? It's foolish. It is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. You, you, okay, so, so, so you bat, nobody can join your church until you know they've been saved and baptized, and you verify that before they're members of your church. But then some visitor comes along into your church, and they just partake of the Lord's Supper, and you say, well, you've got to be saved and baptized. How do you know they are? You don't know anything about these people. And even if you do know of them, they're not of you here. There is a difference in a universal, invisible church and a local New Testament church. There's a great difference between that. This one has oversight. This one has accountability. I can't vouch for anybody else. Can you? It's a, it's a position of authority. We don't have the authority to just administer the Lord's table to anybody. Paul didn't tell them, Paul didn't, Paul didn't give this to the, the church at Ephesus. He gave it to Corinth. Now, it applies to all of them, but my point is, is that there's nothing in the Scriptures that tell us that other people from the outside don't have to have the same oversight that you do to partake in the Lord's table. It makes no sense at all. If you follow that logic, then here's what happens. A person that is disciplined for fornication across town out of their church can be under discipline and can come to your church and come to the table and partake with you. And you don't even know it. Or how's this? I've seen this too before. Uh, it, it, this scenario before too that can come up. Back with back in the in the old time in the in the Southern Baptist Convention, there were churches that that practiced close communion, which is what most Baptists practice today. Close means the door's open, though, just so you know. When the door's closed, it's closed. When it's open, it's open. Even if it's open that much, it's still open. Amen. That's I know that's too logical for some folks, but it's it really is open, right? Because if that door is open that much, you'd say, "Hey, is that door closed?" No, it's open. Okay, give you a better one at night when you're getting ready to go to bed. 
How many of you make sure that door is closed? Amen? You make sure it's closed. If your son leaves that door cracked that much open, you look at him and say, Son, you left the door open. Shut the door. Right? And lock it. Well, that's what we mean by closed. The door is closed to this church. It's this church. That doesn't mean we don't want other folks to join it. That doesn't mean we think we're better than everybody else. No. It's just that there's nothing in the scriptures that you can show me where I have that universal authority over everybody. Come on, think about it. It's logical when you think about it. Well, what about what, do, what if somebody gets their feelings hurt? Well, that's unfortunate, but I'd rather obey Scripture and have your feelings hurt than disobey Scripture and have you feel, feel happy. Does that make sense? Mm, they'll get over it. Especially if they want to obey God and follow Him, they'll get over it. What does that do? It keeps people from coming in and floating in and taking the Lord's Supper and floating right back out and then coming and going as they please and getting all the benefits of being a member but not being a member of a church. Not, not giving their lives and their hearts and their dedication to God. But just floating in and floating out and doing what they want to do. Under no oversight, under no jurisdiction, under, under no authority from the Scriptures, they're not under anybody, they just do whatever they want to do. No accountability to anybody, they get away with everything. Okay, so if you get into sin, I'm supposed to, I, we as a body are supposed to, uh, are supposed to discipline you. And if I get into sin, you as a body are supposed to discipline me. But some, some guy just comes floating in for a service, and he gets to come to the day, and there's no discipline on him. So why do I know about you but not him? Does that make any sense to you? How am I protecting the flock? How am I protecting the flock if I let everybody in and administer those ordinances to everybody? And I don't even know who they are. But I have to know who you are. And, and Brother Joe waited six months to be a member. Was it six or was it nine? It was like nine months. I didn't like him at first, so it took a while. <laughs> I got over it after a while, but it took me nine months to get over it. No, that wasn't it. We just It was baptism. And we were just going through a bunch of things and... He was moving and everything. Just kind of great. But anyway, the point is, is that you did that. So if somebody else comes to the table, he couldn't have came to the table if we had at that point. But we're supposed to just let some guy we don't know anything about or he's just a friend of somebody? No. It doesn't work, folks. It's not biblical. But see, you only get that if you read the whole Bible, not just parts of it and try to find it. For, oh, well, this is the only chapter that deals with the Lord's Supper. No, I think... 1 Corinthians chapter 5 is dealing with it too. He's saying, why are you coming together with these people? Why are you companying with them? Why are you company with fornicators? Why are you company with, with these people? So in other words, what this is telling you folks is that we have to have accountability. We have to have oversight. That's what protects the sheep from the wolves. So the ordinances keep out who's supposed to be out and in who's supposed to be in. That's the way God designed it. I have people say, well, I can't come to your church because of what you believe on baptism. Okay, don't. Don't. <gasps> yeah, don't. Why? Because we already know what we believe. And we're not asking for you to change us. Now, we haven't arrived. We don't know everything. But what I'm saying is that we, we are a church. You coming here won't make us any more of a church. Amen? We're complete right now. When God adds to it, amen. That's God adding to it. But it doesn't change the fact this is still His church. So it doesn't change anything. If you come, praise the Lord, but you come in covenant with us, not trying to change what we believe or not trying to change our minds about things. That's how you have stability, folks, in the Word of God. That's how you're not carried. What, is it, what does Ephesians chapter 4 say? Not carried around or moved around with every wind of doctrine. Not blown around with every wind of doctrine. 
if you start dropping what you believe for people to, to get people to come in, here's what you're doing. You're being blown around by everything. Why? Well, this person might get mad. That person might get mad. Let them get mad. Does it change the fact that we're still a church? No. We have to follow God. We have to understand that, that things have to be done biblically. There has to be a covenant there between those folks. A man is to examine himself, yes. But that's after he's already been through baptism and added to the church. Amen? That's after he's already said, hey, we want to be here. We, we believe what you believe. But today you have so much of the church auditioning for people. You know, they're, they're trying to sell it. Sell the church to people to get them to come in. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be real clear. I'm not backing off to get anybody in here. I'm not changing what I believe according to the scriptures. We're not going to soft sell anything or we're not going to lay off anything to get somebody to be a member of our church. Sorry. We're going to follow God's word. We're not going to change it for anybody. If they come in and then they say, well, I can't stay here. Well, bye. And it's not mean, folks. It's just understanding that this is a flock. <laughs> and I'm to feed the flock of God. To take care of you. You'll understand better when you... It, you under, you all understand that better. They, or those people understand that better when they come in here and become a member and they understand the protection that is there for your family. Amen? That we're not trying to be unequally yoked together. The Bible says, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteous, and what communion hath light with darkness, and what concord hath Christ with Belial, or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel, and what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will dwell in them, and walk in them, and, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and I will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. This is why we hold the closed communion, because we know which direction we're going. Some stranger that comes in among us, we have no clue what their belief. Oh, but they say they do. Well, let them prove it, just like you and I did. Amen. Let them prove it in their lives, and that God is real in their lives. Let it be proven in their lives first. It used to be that's what people believed. You can say you're a Christian all you want to, want to live it. See, this, this church holds you accountable, holds all of us accountable. Those, type, th those people that are out there like that, they don't have accountability. They do what they want. And you're unchristian-like, or you don't love people, if you don't let them come into your church and do whatever they want. That's how they see it. I've seen it before. It's how a lot of people see it. It's not because we're better. It's because we want to be obedient. We want to follow God. We want to obey Him in all things. But I'll tell you, the one thing you have to do now with this, we understand why we do it closed this way. But now here's what you need to do for the next week. You need to examine yourself. Make sure your motive is right. Make sure your heart is right. Make sure your heart is right with your brethren. Make sure you're not holding ill will against your brethren. Make sure your wife and your family and your relationship with them is right. That you're doing things according to scriptures. That you're getting right things that need to be right. That you're dealing with things and your heart is right so you can really concentrate on the death of the Lord. As we come together to... to uh, uh, memorialize Him and His death and what He did for us. To remember what He had did. All this He had done for us. Every, every drop of blood that was shed and His body that was broken for us. That we remember that with all of our hearts and our minds are, are geared towards that when we do that next week. That, we, that we're ready for that. Put away the selfishness and other things and, 
and just think on the Lord this week. Think on what Jesus Christ has done for you. Amen? Think about how much He loved you and how He gave it all for you. It's pretty sad that He gave it all for us and we only give a little for Him. We have a lot of reservations, don't we? In giving ourselves, but He had none. He gave it all. Father, thank You so much for Your Word. I pray, Lord, You'd bless it. I pray You'd help us to understand it and dwell upon it. Help it to sink in our hearts this truth. And bless this baptism, Lord. And thank You for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, we'll get ready here.